We call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Bristol Virginia City Council today, February 22nd, 2022. Please join us for a moment of silence. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. We've got a, a good agenda tonight with a lot of important topics we'll be discussing. Uh, the first item is uh, comments from the council. Thank you. Um, I know at the last meeting, Councilman Osborne mentioned a lot of city employees that had recently got promotions, and it's always good to, to see uh, employees stick with us and, and rise through the ranks. Uh, one that uh, I don't think he had mentioned last time is uh, uh, Detective Crawford, who is now Lieutenant Detective Crawford, and I appreciate his years of service to the police department and our community, and congratulations on the promotion. <laughs> City manager comments. Uh, Gene, could you pull up the calendar? Uh, council, here is a draft calendar, um, and the, a couple of dates on here have changed. That we mentioned at the last meeting, we'll have a final version up tomorrow. Uh, the March 1st and 3rd dates are no longer going to be uh, budget workshops. That will now occur on March the 8th and 10th. And the budget presentation, instead of being on April the 7th, will now be on April the 5th, which is a Tuesday. Does anyone have any issues with the April 5th date? What time of date? Six, will it be in the evening PM, yeah. on April 5th? Um, I may possibly have a conflict. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you confirm that sometime in the next few days? Yeah, I can confirm it tomorrow. Okay. Yes. All right. <coughs> would we still and meet on the 7th? We would not meet on the 7th if we do April 5th. Okay. Okay. All right. And then the other comment I have, uh, there is a landfill update that was just posted a few moments ago on the city website. Okay. All right. The next item of our agenda is matters to be presented by members of the public, non-agenda items. Uh, for these items that are not on the agenda, we had a few folks who signed up. Uh, the first person is Mr. Givney. And as you're making your way to the podium, I'll just remind everyone who may not be familiar, uh, the general council rules are everyone gets three minutes to speak during public comment. Uh, when you begin speaking, the green light will come on, then the yellow light will come on as your time is almost finished. When your time is up, the red light will come on. So we ask you to state your name and your address in the microphone for the record, and we ask you to be courteous of your time and each other's. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the council. My name is Mike Givney. I live at uh, 840 Taylor Street in Bristol, Tennessee. I'd like to talk to you um, about the Freedom of Information Act requests and the necessity for open communication with the public. Um, regarding requests, the, freedom, the Virginia Freedom of Information Act states that it was written to ensure that the people of the Commonwealth have ready access to public records in the custody of a public body. In this case, I'm talking about the, the city of Bristol, Tennessee, or Bristol, Virginia. It further states that the affairs of government are not intended to be conducted in an atmosphere of secrecy. Um, I would like to ask the council to consider that a citizen of Bristol, Virginia had FOIA'd several requests for documents and these documents have not been produced. These requests were submitted to obtain information to better help the public understand what is happening at the landfill. A timeline of that request is as follows. On January 26th, FOIA requests were submitted to the city. That same day, the city clerk 
and forgive me if I pronounce his name wrong, uh, Mr. Lamy, thank you, invoked a seven-day extension to the five days allowed by state law. This is obviously within the law. After that correspondence, nothing more was heard. On February 16th, a letter was written to the city asking for an explanation of the delay and an expected date that the information will be provided and no response was given. Due to the length of time involved and the lack of response, this omission is a violation of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. I am hoping that this is an isolated incident and not a common occurrence here at City Hall. If it is, I would suggest that the City Council look into why this is occurring, why Virginia law is not being followed, and if it is necessary, to put additional staff in place to fulfill FOIA requests. I imagine as the issues with the landfill continue and get worse due to lack of proper engineering solutions, the city will see a sharp increase in these FOIA requests. On the point of communication, the people of Bristol are rightly confused and a bit angry with the handling of the landfill. Much of this, I believe, comes from the lack of interaction from the city with the citizens. Provisions of the law that I stated above were written to promote an increased awareness of governmental activities and afford every opportunity to the citizens to witness the operations of government. Those are exact words from the law itself. Recently, some inroads were made in regards to communication with city officials. This and further engagement of the people of Bristol, perhaps in the form of this meeting, but with a free exchange of, of conversation between the council and the public may help to bridge that gap of distrust between the public and their elected officials. I know many who would certainly like to see that gap and its problems it creates grow smaller. I am certainly one of those and hope that you could consider some type of venue where the council and the public could have a give and take exchange. I thank you in advance for looking into the FOIA request issue that I brought up and look forward to seeing some type of in-person dialogue between the council and the public. Thank you for your time. May I ask a quick question? Sure. That's me over here. Who yes. sent the FOIA request? Um, thank you, Mr. Givner. <clears throat> The next person that signed up for public comment is Kaylee, sorry if I mispronounced this, Hashhauser? Holshauser. Holshauser, okay. <laughs> My name is Kaylee Holshauser. I live in Bristol, Tennessee. So I wanted to give you an account of what I myself experienced with my health from this landfill. Um, I actually happen to live on the other side of town, um, right off of Stafford Street in one of the, those, in one of two apartment complexes and I can smell it all the way over there. In addition to that, I do a delivery job around town in both Bristol, Tennessee and Bristol, Virginia. So, I wasn't aware of the landfill until a few months ago when I actually started to smell it. And not just that, but every time I have to do a delivery around this landfill, I do experience migraines, nausea, sometimes vomiting. And it's a good thing that I can start and stop working whenever I want, or else I would have been fired by now because I have to actually end my shift early every time you know I attempt to go out and do any deliveries around in this area because of how bad I feel. You know, I have chronic migraines and those are getting better until, you know, I actually started noticing the smell until it actually started getting really bad. And, you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't do a lot of public speaking, but, um, you know, all, even on the other side of town, I still, I still get, the health effects from these gases, uh, you know, constant headaches and, and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I happened to take a, I took a woman to a residence near this landfill and I walked in her house and the smell was actually inside her house. Um, and it was, I, it, I was really baffled because usually if, you, if it's just a smell then it's not going to 
really seeping your house. So that is another indication it's gas. Every time uh, I also try to eat at any restaurants in this area, it's not just a smell, you know, coming through my nose, but I can also taste the gas. I can literally taste it every time I eat something. And now everything, everything smells like uh, the, the landfill to me now. I can, uh, it does, it really affects my daily activities because I can, I can smell it. When I eat, I can taste it. And like I said, just constant migraines, nausea, and a lot of fatigue. I find myself having to sleep a lot um, from the effects of these gases coming from the landfill. And I'm pretty sure I speak for a lot of other citizens here in Bristol, Tennessee and Bristol, Virginia. Um, you know, a few other people actually told me that their, their pets are distressed um, and some of them are having heart attacks and actually dying from the distress that they are feeling. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kayleen. The next person that signed up for public comment is Mike Dean. I just have a uh, map I did up for, for you guys. <coughs> Thank you. All right, good evening, Council. So tonight I want to point out the severity of the situation that's happening here with this landfill by handing out a map of some of the current data of the well temperature readings. <coughs> this is some of the work with actual scientists and engineers that have done, been done in collaboration with Hope for Bristol. When we spoke back in July, you've seen some hot wells that were a concern for us to look deeper into the situation that's happening. As more work and more wells were being drilled, you were finally getting a clearer image of how dire this is and how rapidly this has spread within eight months. Looking at the data, this is given a free and very informative service to the community. So when the city delays and flat out refuses FOIA requests from their own residents, not only are they violating Virginia law, but as well as the Freedom of Information Act. When those requests are not ful fulfilled, they are hindering us from being able to help out the community as well as giving a clearer picture to the city council at what is really happening in that landfill. I know more wells are going to be drilled and with that will cause more toxins in the air and I'm asking the city to please step up and help the community members that voted for you guys to sit in those seats. Um, in the future, um, with the landfill update that was posted today, I seen that Michael Roban from DEQ came down and um, why are the citizens of Bristol, Virginia being excluded from, uh, from these public meetings through state officials? Um, Again, more clarity through the citizens of the people that put you there. They have every right to be there, to be updated with more information. When Dr. Pre uh, Benson presented his um, presentation two weeks ago, he only gave a clear picture of what can happen by filling up a landfill. Never gave an option from what you guys questioned that day you got to seek other options besides just filling it up with 150 more feet of garbage and waste. Look at those subsurface reactions. That will spread a lot more coming future. And like I said, 10 years from now, I don't want my 23 year old at that time, son being standing up at this podium fighting for his community. I'm deciding to stay here. I'm putting lots of money to, to help myself and my family with this situation by adding rooms in my house, by getting trailers to get out of the city once a month. Um, I just came back from a vacation for over a week and I felt amazing just to get out of here. The first three days, my, I, it, everything was just, it was disgusting how I felt. And I know it's what's in the air and what we're breathing. So 
please, you know, work with the people. We're here to help you. We're not here to fight you guys. We just want clear communication going forward and, and uh, any way to resolve this in a faster manner. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Dean. The next person that signed up is Mr. Kellogg. I brought presents too. Good evening, Council. I brought you some items tonight, courtesy of Hope for Bristol. Um, actually, I think I gave Joey the loose brochure that I had. But um, so the first thing you'll see is uh, is a nice trifle brochure that was produced by Southerly Magazine. Um, they worked with the community to develop the content, um, did all the graphics, and shipped us a, a bunch of these for free. Um, this is the kind of community engagement that we um, that, that we're able to get. Um, the second one, just because I couldn't resist, is our new landfill yard sign magnet, refrigerator magnet. The third item is what I'm here to discuss tonight. Okay, so this is an image taken from Greater Graper Agents' presentation to VADQ in January regarding an experimental program to capture fugitive emissions emanating from outside the liner of our landfill. So we're all aware that these fugitive emissions are the single biggest issue for our affected residents. And I'm actually going to take a moment here and give kudos to Mr. Wingard. Mr. Wingard, hearing you passionately acknowledge the impact of these fugitive emissions at the last council meeting was refreshing for myself and for all of us at Hope for Bristol. So thank you. Now back to this image. This is a section of a landfill liner. Okay, I'm not a landfill expert. But I do know a couple. This is something you don't drill a hole in. The liner keeps the stuff inside the landfill. And I know this is just a test piece, but your experts sent this image to the Virginia DEQ. Come on now. Um, these fugitive emissions are gassing our neighborhood 24 7, and you all approved money for an experimental erector set. This, I, 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 I can't even begin to explain how I felt when I looked through that presentation. So there's not even, coming from this fish, you're not even 2% methane. You can't burn it. You're gonna have to run a propane assist 24 seven. Okay, how much is that gonna cost? Testing would have confirmed that before you even spent any money. And you all approve, fun, you, you approve funds for this, right? I don't know what you're thinking sometimes. I really don't. Our community is suffering, and we need help. We need expert help. Expert help. I'm losing my place here. I'm sorry. It's been a rough day. It's time to find somebody who can help solve this crisis instead of someone who can help with a lawsuit. And if you think one letter to the EPA is going to solve this, it's not, because we've written dozens of letters. If each of you is not calling, writing, and emailing the leaders of those agencies and the leaders of our, your state on a daily basis, then you are not exercising your due diligence. You are not. The EPA has the funds. The EPA has access to real experts. And you need to be contacting them every day until we get help. Stop the experimenting. This community deserves better. So we at Hope understand that you have jobs and family and obligations. We do as well but we spend hundreds of hours every week trying to get a resolution for our community. I'll ask you, how many hours have you spent on the single most important issue in our community? It's not been enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kellogg. The next person that signed up for public comment is Mr. Nupp. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Why'd you put me last? <laughs> but anyways, uh, Chris Nup, Shakespeare Road, Bristol, Virginia. I'm not a landfill expert. 
an engineer, scientist, chemist, but I am a concerned citizen here. We're all hurting. Everybody in this room is hurting some way or another over this. I know a lot of you families. I've watched you grow. Uh, Dr. Benton, two weeks ago, here we go. I'm, all of you have done a good job asking questions, okay? Kevin hit him hard. He did, and I like that. These sidewall emissions, chimneys, whatever you want to call them, you can't get nowhere near them. They'll knock you out. Anthony, you're shaking your head. Yes, you know, you smelt it. All of you, Randy, all of you have smelt it. And I know Joe back here just said, quit experimenting. Maybe we need to experiment a little bit. We're waiting on things to happen. We can't stand around with our hands in our pockets. We need to get out and get something done. Experiment a little bit while we're waiting on the experts. I'm not trying to discredit the experts. They're experts for a reason. I've got common sense. I don't have a whole lot of education. There's a saying, some dumb, not plumb dumb. Guys, uh, we're on the plumb dumb side here, okay? I'm getting a little excited here, kind of agitated. Gentleman back here said a lot of people's agitated here in Bristol. Damn right they are. They're mad. And I hope and pray that nobody does anything stupid over this. We're, it's pushing people. It's pushing people to the edge. I don't know what else to say on that part. But yes, I agree with the experts on a lot of things. And it's like filling this landfill up and capping it. Maybe out of work, but that's 15 years. I'll be dead in 15 years, probably. I mean, I'm not, it, it, it is what it is. I've crossed over to the old parts. Uh, but putting today's trash in, and it becomes tomorrow's, then next year, and these hot wells that's out of control right now, What's going to happen to another 150 feet of it? Even when we cap it, even when we turn the water loose on it, you still got your underground water. And I know it's y'all trying to get it out. It, it, it's kind of too late. It's already happening. De decomposing faster than we can keep up with. Let's try to experiment with some of these sidewalls. What can it hurt? Hell, nothing else has worked. I appreciate you. Don't mean to get excited up here, but I'm kind of one of these agitated citizens too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nup. The, the next person that signed up for public comment is Mr. Victor Smith. Good evening. Members of the council, my name's Victor Smith. I live at 210 Farmstead Lane. I used to live at 169 Chester Hill Road. That's the same street. You people must have changed the street name. Uh, I'm here about the TV. Uh, I spoke to uh, a representative just a little while ago, and uh, I've spoken to him about three or four times, and all I get is that uh, information that they're working on it. Now, this is the same sheet that I had passed out to you, so it won't take much of your time. Uh, you can read it at your leisure. I just hope that uh, something can be resolved because I like to uh, watch Fox because they let me know what's going on in this world. And uh, since I've been retired for 25 years, I don't have uh, much to do except watch TV. So if you would investigate why Point Broadband can't resolve the problem with uh, clearing up that gray scale, and I'm sure there's many people here who have also experienced it. And that's, that's about it, what I have to say. I appreciate any effort that can be done. If these people can't solve the problem, get rid of them. Find somebody else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. That's the last person that signed up for public comment for a non-agenda item. 
Uh, now we're looking for a motion from the council to adopt our regular agenda. Um, I move for the adoption of the agenda with the following changes. Uh, I move that we switch the order on items three and four. So what's currently item four will be item three and vice versa. Okay. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second for the adoption of the agenda with the changes noted. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. <clears throat> Item one of our regular agenda, presentation by Blue Line Solutions for school, safety's, school zone safety. No one signed up for public comment for this item. Staff report. Good evening. My name is Mark Hutchinson and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Blue Line Solutions. Uh, we're out of, based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, but I grew up over in Shady Valley, uh, over in Johnson County, Tennessee, and my mom worked at Raytheon here for a number of years, so although I live in Shady, this is still uh, some place that I'm proud to call home. Uh, with me is Greg Hawkston, he just retired 20, 25 years in law enforcement uh, from the state of Virginia law enforcement here in Bristol. So we're, we appreciate you having us. What I'd like to talk to you about is a program that uh, my company uh, would like to express to the city. And first of all, it costs nothing. There are no costs ever for any reason uh, for this program. But that is uh, to make your school, school zone safer. My company is an automated speed enforcement company in which we put uh, cameras up in the school zones. And they do two things. One is they capture the speed of vehicles uh, driving through school zones and two they capture uh, information on people um, or cars that may drive by the school zones that uh, may have wanted individuals in them child sex offenders and so forth um, so what we do is we start with speed data to determine if there is a problem in your school zones and we did um, four sp speed studies uh, the first one, and I think you have these packets, uh, Virginia Middle School. We set the, these little radar boxes out about this big, and we just set them out there to capture speed data. And they captured data for 24-hour period, but we only ran the data for 7.30 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. So this only counts the time period while school is in session and kids are there. You can see on the front page of that, uh, speed study at Virginia Middle School, there was 28,140 vehicles that came through during those hours. And 1,773 were speeding above 10 miles an hour above the speed limit. Now the Virginia law that was adopted last year allowing this type of enforcement has set a threshold of 10 miles an hour above the speed limit as the allowable enforcement uh, threshold. So any violation in this paper or on these studies would be at 10 and above the speed limit. So in this school zone, you have 1,773 vehicles in five days. In other words, 5,000 some odd vehicles in the course of a month speeding at 10 and above the speed limit. You can go to the second page and you can see that 1,437 of those were going 11 to 14 over, 303 were going 15 to 20 over and 33 were going 21 plus over. So you can go to Stonewall Elementary School. That's the next one we did. There was 29,851 vehicles that passed through from 7.30 to 4 and 2,803 vehicles were traveling at 10 and above the speed limit. So in well over 10,000 uh, cars a, a month uh, in that school zone. We can go to Virginia High School. This one's not quite as bad, but we see that the, uh, the total vehicle count is lower, so it's not quite as traveled as the last one, but 4,913 vehicles traveling through and 478 speeding above 10 miles an hour and above, so about 1,000 violators a month. And then lastly, Virginia High School. 4,970 vehicles with 1,092 
or about 4,400 vehicles speeding at 10 and, miles out, 10 and above the speed limit every month. So if we ask parents of those school systems, do we have a problem? I think every parent that's ever been a parent would say yes, we have a pretty significant problem uh, because it only takes once to pick up a child um, and put them in a body bag, as I have as, from being a retired cop myself, uh, to know that one is too many. So what we do in our program is we take, we took the model of click it or ticket because many of these programs and many of these companies, they simply want to write tickets and cash checks. They want to make as much money as they can and they don't care about the problem. We are exactly the opposite. We try to drive down the numbers um, by implementing a program that follows the click it or ticket model. Now all of you are familiar with click it or ticket. It's a, it's a NHTSA, a federal campaign that started in 2000. It was my job when I worked with the governor's office in Tennessee to roll that program out across the state to law enforcement. And the first thing that we did was we sat down in cars as vehicles would drive by throughout the state and watch people drive by and mark down whether they were wearing seat belts or not. Because we had to get a baseline um, seat belt usage rate to know uh, where it was at. And I think it was in the low 70s if I remember correctly. The second thing we did was started sending information to um, health departments and pediatricians offices and so forth. Seat belts are important, click it or ticket, trying to send information out to the public. The third thing that we did was we started putting commercials on TV. How many of you have seen a click it or ticket commercial? Everybody in America has, right? Because it's the national model. But that's more public information and education. It's also a warning. Law enforcement's going to be out in two weeks. Click it or ticket, right? What happened after the commercials? Law enforcement got out and did the enforcement. They do this you know, about every Memorial Day, every Labor Day, and holidays, right? So following the enforcement, we got out and we watched people drive by, marked down whether they were wearing seat belts to see if the seat belt usage rate raised. 22 years later, after that program started, Click It or Ticket is still a successful program and it's still going today. So the reason I'm talking about Click It or Ticket is we use that model in our program as the model to create a, a, a school safety program. So what we did is we started out with a, the data that I just went over. The second thing that we would do is partner with the school system and the police department to send that information to the community. Um, in other words, for the, for the school system of Virginia High School, parents, do you realize that over 4,000 vehicles are driving through your child's school zone every month at 10 and above the speed limit? That's the information that we start with. The second information, and this is sent out through the email portals to the parents through the school systems, uh, through social media, uh, through the school system, social media, through the police department, and press releases. The second thing we do is say that a warning period is going to start on such and such day. And in, for 30 days, only warnings are going to be given to people that drive at 10 miles an hour above the speed limit through that school zone. And then during that first week, we do another sur survey to see what happened during the public information education campaign. Um, during, after the, at the end of that warning period then, we start into enforcement. During week one of the enforcement, we do another five-day survey to determine how the warning period affected driving behavior. And then in week five, we do it again. Now before you, you also should have a Barrow County study. And that study is a study out of Barrow County, Georgia. It's our most recent study. And if you flip over to the fourth page, you can see there were uh, about nine, nine schools in this program. I'm just going to talk about the, the top one, Appalachia High, had 1,190 uh, violations similar to what one of your schools had. In the PID, in that, per, in that first section of the public information education, it dropped to 189 without writing the first ticket. Then during the warning period, it dropped to 108 during the enforcement period, 78. And then during the post enforcement, we're down, post -enforcement, we're down to 46. Is that a successful program? 
Absolutely. Look how much safer that school and that community is. Now, if you look down at the bottom, uh, the program, uh, I'm sorry, the totals there, among all these schools, we started out with 17,595 violations. During the PINE, it dropped down to 7,527. Then down to the warnings, 3,859. And we still haven't written the first ticket at that point. And then when the enforcement started, 2,214. And then finally in week five, down to 1,329. For the people who want to call our program a cash grab, a money grab. This is a 92% reduction. Only 8% of the drivers are continuing to speed. And should they pay a fine? Absolutely, they're doing 10 miles an hour and above the speed limit after all of this public information and education and warnings. So that's kind of the way that our program works. Additionally, we provide automated license plate recognition cameras at no cost to the city for this program as well. And that allows um, the police department to put in what we call hot list into a, um, a system. And it does, this, these cameras do not run the registration of anybody going by them. The camera does not know who's going by them. The police department does not know who's going by them. The only thing it does is it captures that license plate and, and compares it against the database. If there is a database in which this tag number is associated with a wanted criminal, the police department will be notified immediately. If a child sex offender is coming into the school zone three times a week during recess, those type of things can be reported to the police department through this, um, through this technology, all at no cost to the city. So um, I've tried to watch my time here and be respectful of it. Um, but it quit at eight minutes, 10 seconds. I don't know where I'm at. So I'm going to go ahead and stop and ask if you have any questions. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Hudson. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, I, I will start by saying I am got some serious issues with speed and traffic enforcement cameras okay. to start with. But <clears throat> I do have quite a few questions. Uh, one, you show us data for three schools. Why did you pick three of the six schools? Why, why those three? Well, there, there were four. Um, there was I, three. There's three. Virginia High School, Virginia Middle, and the elementary school was selected because that's the highest volume of schools at this point in time. And then we were in, spoke with the chief. We would come back and do follow-up studies and provide that to each council member also. Okay, that, that way every school's covered because there's no kid in one school that's more important than any other school in the city. But we've got multiple agencies, multiple counties, multiple jurisdictions. We've got different studies going on at one time. So we do have a backlog of work coming back in and catching up each and every one of them at that point in time. Okay, that's fine. I understand, I understand that. Uh, the next question is, for to collect this data, where did you exactly clock people speak? For example, at the high school, it says, Valley Drive and Virginia High. Where, where? What we do on that is we go where the school zones are properly marked by statute by Virginia County. Mm -hmm. We stay in the middle of the school zone. You never want to capture data where somebody's coming from a higher speed zone to a lower speed zone. We were right in the middle. So when you come up West Valley at the intersection there at the church, you go to the crest of the hill. Mm -hmm. We stay right on the crest of the hill because that's exactly in the middle of the school zone. Same thing on Glenway, same thing on Piedmont, same thing on Euclid. Okay. So we stay exactly in the middle of the school zone because if it is ever implemented in any jurisdiction, the actual camera that does the enforcement is inside of the marked areas where there's a reduced zone because it's at that furthest. Okay, and, and that was my next question, and I think, um, yeah, Gene's got it pulled up because this. Uh, is where are you actually going to put these? And I'm going to give the example right here of Highland View because I'm very familiar with that. I probably go through that intersection at Texas and, and uh, Rhode Island a dozen times a day, coming and going. And the thing is, I go down Massachusetts and I go up Texas, I don't pass one sign that tells me I entered the school zone. Okay. When you look at different school zones, it's based on how it's laid out, whether enforcement can be conducted. Okay. I, but yeah. there, there, there is no sign going, uh, I guess, 
going towards away from Massachusetts going to Texas. The one at Texas is down just past Candy Alley. There's a small stretch of Massachusetts down there between Hughes Street and Hillsville, yes, Hillside, and then Rhode Island, it's right there just uh, past the alley there uh, where the school zone starts. Yes, sir. So, so here's, here, I'm gonna give you, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to see people speeding through school. I mean, I, you know, I've got a, my daughter goes there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is the example I'm gonna give. Today, I got a call from the school that somebody hit a school bus on the way home. They hit the school bus right there in front of the church on Rhode Island. Right. That's 100 yards past the school zone. How would what you're doing have prevented that? Because the, where the school zone ends is probably 100 foot from an intersection. Well, I, I, I see exactly what you're saying there, but each school zone is set up and laid out differently. Trust me, I've, I've traveled from Buchanan County to Virginia Beach to Fairfax. Every jurisdiction, you would think that there would be uniformity across the state on how school zones are marked and laid out. The more you travel, you find out the least that applies. So each school zone is completely different. So that's why there's baseline speed studies conducted in each zone to see if there's a problem. And we went into other jurisdictions where school zones have been improperly marked, improperly posted, so we've had to go back and speak with their governing board and saying, hey, we've identified a problem. They work hand in hand with the school administration, the maintenance guys who usually handle how they mark the school zones. And we work that out to make sure that the schools are properly marked. And if we don't have the sufficient data to show that there's a problem, then the, the system wouldn't be implemented in that zone. But there's other issues, what they call traffic calming, which means there's Everybody's seen the radar signs that you put up. It tells you how fast you're going before you get to a school zone. We supply those to the jurisdiction for free at no cost. So there's so many multiple avenues to go through to make sure to ensure that a school zone is protected because the last thing that I want to do, and, and guys, I worked here from 2019 to, to, to just December. And to be honest with you, I drove around Bristol for 16 years when I worked for the county. And until you come and you work here, I have a newfound respect for the men and women in uniform on the call volume that they handle each and every day. And when you go and you're assigned an area for speed enforcement, especially during the morning, we've got an SRO in our schools. They want to patrol units to sit out here in front of the schools to try to slow people down. Every time you go try to do something, you get a call for service and you get pulled away. There's just not enough to go around to keep up with the call volume. This is a force multiplier that's at no cost to the city or to any locality that can be utilized to, as an extra added protection for our kids in their school homes. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, Mr. Hartley. I mean, you've been a tremendous supporter of the police department. And, and here's the thing. The primary focus of this program is the safety of our children. That's right. And, and he's going to briefly touch, or I can, on this. There's also what they call ALPR technology, automated license plate recognition that is free with every school zone, like he was talking about. And here's the thing, and you can take it from me, I worked here. Nine times out of 10, when we're dispatched to a crime in progress call, whether it be an assault against a person, a breaking and entering, we usually pass the offender going the other way, trying to get there. And when we get there, we have no information to go on, except go around knocking on doors and see who's seen anything, see who heard anything. Did anybody get a vehicle description? Did anybody get a tag? A lot of people don't want to comply because they're just, just afraid of retaliation. The investigations here in the city, us in uniform when I was here, we really had nothing to go on. But with the free AL, ALPR technology available, if someone comes into your school and does an abduction of a child, every vehicle, 24 hours a day, is getting captured going through that school zone, and it's at no cost for the city. If there's a shooting in the school zone, and God forbid it ever happens, and we're responding, our, our guys and gals in uniform, and that shooter leaves that school zone, you're gonna have somewhere to go, somewhere to start looking. We have, uh, this technology has been uh, responsible for three uh, crime solvings in Barrow County, the same study. Um, what other questions might you have, uh, Councilman? Yeah, I mean, here we're here to help. I mean, like I say, I, I can think just right there, the way the school zone's set up, if you put, you, you've got to put probably four different cameras up around that school. Well, and it just depends upon how it's And some of them, yeah. uh, you know, depending where they're at, are on a section that's literally 
a hundred foot between intersection to intersection. Nobody's speeding through right. there unless they're, yeah. you know. If, if in this, um, if, if the speed data um, doesn't reflect a problem, there's no problem to solve it with technology, right? So what we might do is still provide the radar speed signs that show the speed, the speed as you dra travel toward it, just as he called it a calming device. We can only work in the properly marked school zones of the city. Yeah. If it's not a properly marked school zone, we can't even work it. Well, it, it, and there's part of the issue. I yeah. mean, because I come over here, I come around Piedmont by the middle school, see yeah, where that right. way, to, you know, the you. school zone starts maybe less than 50 feet before you get to the intersection from Piedmont and then goes up to uh, the intersection there where you come, what would that be? I guess that's uh, Mary Street right mm -hmm. there. Right, really right at the edge of the school's property. So, you know, if somebody's coming, unless they're really barreling down Piedmont in front that way, the red light's going to slow them down and stop them. So, I mean, the way, you know, to me, a lot of this, you know, where you put these, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's, well, it's put within inside of a school zone, in the center part of it. To yeah. Catch the people that's in the heart of the school zone actually doing it. And for being an officer here on Piedmont in that area that you're talking about, I wrote plenty of summonses for people violation, you know, speeding in those areas. So it is prevalent. It is there. It has happened. But like you say, you can't address it all the time because you don't have enough officers to do it. This is a force multiplier at no cost to the city to help. And, and just the only thing I, I'd like to touch base on as far as the ALPR technology, there's a lot of good people here in Bristol. I met a tremendous amount of good people. People get up every day, they go to work, they pay the bills, they try to do the best to keep the property looking good, they do maintenance, and it is so hard to go take a theft call where someone's had a thousand dollar piece of equipment stolen and nowhere to go on it. At least we have something in pinch points of the city and ALPR technology can be implemented in other parts to aid investigations. And we get so many calls, whether it be a shots fired, a stabbing, and we get there, you go to interview people, no one heard anything, no one seen anything, we have nothing to go on. And when we lie right on the Tennessee line, it's very, very hard. This is technology that you can implement and put into certain places to where you have an investigative tool at your fingertips to help this department solve a major crime. It could be a robbery, it could be a murder, it could be a rape, it could be any type of violent crime, and we had nothing to go on. But right now you have something at your fingertips. So. And the, the, the byproduct is the, is the enforcement side to help our schools. And like I say, it's continuous data that's being captured and it's at the availability of the police department at any point in time. And it's at no cost to your locality or facility or anything at any point in time. So one last question yes, and then I'll, I'll let others yeah, ask questions. Fine. But um, according to this, the, the code, the new law took effect uh, 2020. Yes, sir. Do How many know? localities in Virginia have implemented something like this? As of right now, we just went before the full board uh, supervisors from Wythe County two weeks ago. We got a full vote at that point in time to move forward and implement the ordinance to have the ordinance passed. Uh, when the pandemic hit, it kind of put everything on its heels because no one wanted to meet in person. Things have started back. I've met with multiple agencies. We've got a lot of jurisdictions in Southwest Virginia simply because they want to protect our kids, number one, priority number one, children first. But the byproduct of it is having the availability of the investigative tool because you imagine how much could be solved in Southwest Virginia. If Smith County, Wythe County, Washington County, Bristol, Pulaski, Bland, Carroll, Montgomery, and you go to name all these localities had the same database where they could go and research ALPR technology to help aid each other in investigations. And law enforcement, 25 years, and this is retired law enforcement, we're our own worst enemy as far as not sharing information. So when you have a portal put in place and you've got a victim in Bristol, and maybe they're going into Tennessee, maybe they're going into Washington County, when you can sit there and share that information and help get that lady's ring that's been passed down through three generations stolen or broken into, or a firearm, or a four-wheeler, or a trailer, and you have something to go on, because you've got a pool of information that's shared between multiple jurisdictions, that's a tool that you can't put a price on. Because there's nothing like working a crime of property and going back to a family and turning, turning 
evidence back over to them that they worked hard for and paid for. To, to answer your question directly, the only one that we know of that's fully implemented is the yes. city of Fairfax. Right now, city of Fairfax okay. is in place. So I have a, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a few questions. Yes, sir. Um, so just to clarify, so Mr. Mr. Hartley asked a lot of the questions I had. Um, 10 miles an hour is the trigger, right? So, so someone's going. Let, let's, um, 10 miles an hour is set by statute. Yeah. yeah. If the, the chief or the council or, or the governing body here chose to set it above, mm -hmm. you can. It, it can be set above, it just can't be set below per law. Okay. And so, so basically, during school hours, it, it, it's 25 in school zones while they're going in and out of school, right? So say at 2 in the after, or 1 in the afternoon, we'll say it's 35 in front of Stonewall Jackson. But, and I believe, I know there had been a, um, there'd been a parent killed in front of Stonewall Jackson about 20 years ago, I think, and that was not during going in or coming out hours. That was in the middle of the day, I think. So just to run through the numbers you gave us. You know, I, I did the math out over here. Um, so 6% of the people in front of Virginia Middle School were speeding overall, 9% in front of Stonewall. And on the two approaches that you studied for Virginia High School, the overall combined percentage was 16, right? Yeah, Glen Way was the lowest one. Yeah, and, and so it yeah. skewed higher for Virginia High because Valley Drive is coming down a hill, That's basically. Way, yeah, you got it both ways, sir. That's correct. Okay. So one concern that I have that uh, Mr. Hartley did not bring up. So I remember, I'm gonna tell you a little story. About 15 years ago, we were in Kingsport, my dad and I, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a traffic light in front of the hospital and the light turned red very fast. And he got a ticket in the mail with, with his picture driving the car. And I won't tell you exactly the four letter word he said, but uh, he said, I'm not gonna pay this. And so he never paid it and no, negative ramifications came from it. So this doesn't carry any legal weight, no, does it? No, it's not reported to the DMV. It does not hit your driver's license. It does not go on your insurance. You do not incur any points to the DMV system on this. Mm -hmm. So say somebody gets one of these and they they don't pay it. What happens? I'll read that right to you. The, um, the law says that it can, can be turned over to a collection agency. Um, the maximum about allowed by law. Um, it, it does offer some other um, avenues by which they can be served uh, through uh, the sheriff's office. Um, so there, there is some teeth, but not the type of teeth as other states would have. Mm -hmm. um, as Greg had mentioned, it's a civil violation sim similar to a toll, uh, a toll booth violation or a parking ticket um, so it's it's civil in the same ways that those are civil. Yeah. So what's the average fine run for these? these the, the Virginia law um, establishes a maximum of the fine, and that is a maximum of $100. Um, generally, what we recommend as a company, it, it already is addressed in the law, and that is that those fines be lower than, than, if, than an officer issued ticket. The reason for that is <clears throat> If, if somebody makes a complaint that they got a ticket in a school zone uh, and they, they have a $100 ticket and they complain, say, to the chief, the chief could tell them, or you could tell them, um, if you had been written by an officer, it would have been this much. It would have went against your license, it would have went against your uh, insurance, but this one's cheaper and it doesn't go against those things. So if you're going to receive a citation, this is the most uh, lenient one. Uh, you know, that, that you could receive. So it, to, to answer Mr. Hartley's, um, or Councilman Hartley's question a few minutes ago about what would it help in this situation, um, as, a, as a police <coughs> officer, uh, I've had the experience as Greg has, many others who were crashes. And we know that it's, even as crashes occur, the slower the traffic, the less injury, you know, of the crash. Mm -hmm. And that's really the goal, is to slow traffic down in this area. Um, if it's not in that school zone, would it still matter? We don't really know without, you know, doing, doing some testing and capturing some data, but we know that it's not going to 
go the other direction. You know, we know that it's not going to go up higher. Well, and, and I mean, that's my concern, is knowing where those school zones are and how people drive through that right. neighborhood, that you're not, people aren't speeding in the school zone because they're speeding beyond the school zone. Right. On, on Rhode Island, the on, on Massachusetts, yes, that little stretch of school zone, that's not where they're speeding them. The, that's where they're picking up speed, speed. to speed somewhere that's else on that's the street. Exactly so, right. uh, you know, that's why I say, I don't know how effective this would be actually catching them. Uh, because that's not, to me, you're not putting the, the, the camera in the right place, but it's well, not in the, the school zone. Right, and the statute won't let us go outside of it right now. They, they submitted new legislation this year, and it got tabled in committee to bring it out to different locations within a locality. They just wanted to focus on the two primary places, which was school zones and work zones. Yeah, and, and I, I, I have no idea whether that speed was a factor in that or not. I, I got could be today, but it, I thought it was interesting that, it is. you know, this is on the agenda and my daughter come home <laughs> and told me that. Right. So. We had a, um, one of the other schools that we work with in Georgia, um, it was in South Fulton, and two years ago they had a little 10 year old girl killed in the school zone, her, her name was Renai Majors, and uh, that community named the ordinance after that little girl, uh, because one is too many, right? And um, as a cop, the reason that I chose to do this after my cop life was when I was, a, when I was a police officer, I was always reacting to something. I was reacting to a burglary, reacting to a domestic, reacting to a call of some kind. Mm -hmm. But I had a little 10-year-old boy die in my arms one day, and I realized this didn't have to happen. This could have been prevented. And traffic enforcement is the one thing that I could do as a cop to stop the dying before it happens. I could be proactive. And that's the reason this technology exists and the reason that we run this program this way is to be proactive and not reactive. We don't want to send the ambulance after the little girl. We want to stop it from happening in the first place. <coughs> okay. So, let me ask another question. Um, I'm looking here at this, uh, uh, for example, at the high school. And you have uh, 7.30 to 9, 9 to 2.30, 2.30 to 4. So if you put these in, when would you actually? Okay, that's, that's one of the actual speed limit changes is when they have interactions with the buses of the mornings. That's the 7.30 to 9, the 2.30 to 4, whatever it is. We'd have to get a, a, a specific window of time to get it down to the minute with the school lights. Um, the middle of the day, school is still in session. There's children interaction coming out. There's buses at all times during the day. If the speed limit changes back up to say a 35 or a 45 zone, then the 10 mile an hour window by statute, you could not receive a summons of any type unless you were 10 miles above that speed limit change in the middle of the day. So if it's 35 all day long and it drops to 25 of the morning, 25 of the afternoon, during that window of time of the morning and afternoon, you have a 10 mile and then once you hit 11 it's over once that time changes and lights go off it goes back to the standard speed limit then you would have that 10 mile an hour window there as long as school is in session okay when it's over the cameras are con the cameras are continuously capturing data and photos but they're only processed at the times that the schools are in session we hold off a day for processing simply because if you have a bomb threat at one of your schools, you have a teacher work day, you have a, a water main break, the agency shoots us an email and says, hey, no processing on this day, school is out. We coil that day and we do not process any violations for that day. So we are very aware of our time. We work hand in hand with the agency to let us know with the school system if they have an early teacher work day, if they go hybrid because of COVID, then guess what? We're, we don't capture any data during that day. Well, thank you all for the thank information, you. for the presentation, and um, I had some questions, but Mr. Hartley asked oh, all of them okay, already. Okay. So, yeah, so. <laughs> Sorry for so. yeah, go right ahead if you have a question. Well, yeah, he already did. So, um, uh, yes, even though you didn't sign up for public comment, if you'd like to go ahead and ask, yeah. that's that's fine. Okay. One of the things, as Greg mentioned, you know, we find from time to time that 
you know, back in the 60s, for instance, when this school zone was created, the communities changed a lot, right? And now it doesn't make so much sense that that school zone be in the same spot that it was, you know, 40 years ago. So sometimes we go into these and when we send in the uh, traffic engineering or um, the, the site plans that we have to do to scale to uh, public works or the state, you know, some, somebody looks at this and says, hey, this needs to be changed. And to Councilman Hartley's um, point there, um, you know, that would be a good thing for the community, you know, for those things to be changed and made better. Mm -hmm. So as part of this entire process through the permitting, we hope that if there are uh, things that need to be changed, this is an opportunity to do that. Well, and okay. <clears throat> again, I, I, I don't know, um, how it how it's set up it, and if it's so many feet from the school that like i say you look there the way highland view is and you start drawing you know because uh, it it comes down in a weird way mm -hmm. but it's been that way for i dare say 40 years that i i can remember and and so you know again uh you know, I, I think it's more just somebody took a and drew a circle around the school and where it crossed. Because if you kind of look, that that seems to be how it is. And I assume, and Jay, uh, look, you, you might know by code or something if it if it's that way. Well, usually the school zones are set either there's there's some language in the MUTCD and possibly the state itself might have some other language as well because uh, they are allowed to go over and above the, the manual on uniform traffic control devices that's the federal standard so but I don't know I wasn't involved in setting yeah. these but they you know they have been looked at it's it, chances are they are you know conforming but I can't tell you that 100% without going out and looking at it well um, I know that we just met today you don't know me um, but I will tell you that I run a very transparent company um, and we do not, nor will we, do anything that is not ethically and, and uh, ethically strong, uh, nor doesn't have integrity. And if we've un uncovered a problem with one of these not meeting MUTC guidelines, we would bring it up because um, it's in our best interest, it's in the community's best interest that all these be marked properly. Um, one of the things that we failed to say, and this goes back to the transparency, the, the Virginia Code says that this has to be marked at least a warning a thousand feet from within a thousand feet from the enforcement. Next, we would give the city one of those radar speed signs that shows you how fast you're going and we would suggest to put it second and then you have either the flashers or the placards, you know, that indicate the school zone. So you have three warnings as you before you enter in the school zone one of them showing you how fast you're going now i don't know uh, how much more tr transparent a program can be but um, that's what we're trying to convey and the fact is um, I'm, we're still doing research to determine what percentage that slows uh, people down that actual sign but we do know by putting it there that a, a percentage of people slow down that wouldn't otherwise. And that's good for the school zone. So we try very hard to be transparent and to show the community and show the council that we're not about just trying to make a bunch of money. And, and I'm not gonna lie to you, we're in a business and we will make money off the 8% in Barrow County who are still speeding, right? But we dropped it 92%. And that's the goal here, it's, it's the mission. So thank you. I have a question. Yep. <clears throat> okay, all the license plates that's going to be red. <clears throat> what kind of manpower are you talking about uh, involved in uh, reading? Let's, let's say there's a break in in the area. Uh, and you got a description of the vehicle. Okay. Who's going to monitor those cameras to see we, what tags come through there? This, the software is set up such that. Um, you can either do proactive um, alerts, so if there was a, a wanted car or a wanted individual and they were associated with such a tag, uh, a, an officer could get an alert on his phone, on his laptop in the car, or dispatch could get alerted to say, 
that car is right there right now. But you're talking about a car comes through and now you're doing an investigation. This is a reactive type of enforcement. So uh, let's say it was a white Honda. You could simply go to the computer, type in white Honda, and it'll pull up every white Honda that came through the, those cameras within a, you know, a period of time. You could put a particular day at a particular time. So literally within, you know, as fast as you can just type it in, it gives you the answer. Um, what's interesting about this type of technology is let's say that, um, Councilman Wingard, if you had a, one of these cameras in your, um, in your neighborhood and then uh, Councilwoman Nave had one in her neighborhood and a burglary was committed uh, four nights ago in her neighborhood and then last night one was committed in your neighborhood, an investigator could go to the software and see what common car tag came through both neighborhoods just like that. That's a place to start for an investigation. So it really cuts down on the amount of time that an, an investigator or any police officer has to, to do anything with it. So the answer to your question, it takes zero time unless the officer wants to do some type of query. And then you can narrow the window down specifically if you take a, a B and E and they say it happened between one o'clock and three o'clock in the morning because someone heard a vehicle in that area, you can specifically research that specific date and time. It's not that you have to go look at 4,000 or 5,000 captures. It's just sitting there for you to drill down into based upon what your investigation calls for. How long do you keep that data? The, I believe the, the law in Virginia in this statute says if it's not used, it's Within 60, 60 days. days. Then it has to be purged from the system on enforcement. If it's the citation is not issued within 30 days, then the, then the actual information has to be purged from the system within 60, and that's by statute. Okay. And I'll, I want to kind of reiterate too that this does not include none of this data includes the the owner, the registered owner, or anything. It's just, it's just simply information. Uh, tag numbers. Yeah. Okay. Um, storing that kind of information over that period of time would take terabytes and terabytes of information. So how do you, how do you make that cost effective? Well, for what, as part of the program, it's just part of our program. Yeah. Um, you might have heard of NCIC. Um, you know, the FBI manages and, uh, you know, provides law enforcement with NCIC services throughout the nation. Inlets is the part of NCIC that houses the registration data. We are an inlets partner. We have been vetted by the FBI to, to do this on behalf of the city. And our server base, our, our server farm, is at the inlets facility in Arizona. So all of our, all of the data um, that is stored uh, for this entire program is stored at the same place that it originated from in the first place. So yeah, that's kind of how it's done. So that's how, uh, that's how it becomes cost effective because you, you farmed out the server yes, you got maintenance. Okay. Yeah. But I, do, I just do want to say that it is CJIS compliant, it's FedRAMP compliant. We have to comply with the same uh, security technologies that the police department here in the city does. What's the quality of, uh, of recording? The, um, I wish I could tell you the exact um, you know, pixels, but um, it's, it is good enough to where we can read a tag uh, at about 160 feet. So uh, about a half of a football field um, we do have some technology that wouldn't necessarily be in school zones, but say on a trailer, for instance, that can read a tag at, you know, 300 to 500 feet. Um, so it just depends on the camera technology. Those that would be in a school zone, though, uh, would, would normally be captured at about 80 feet. Okay. All good info. So, well, we... Uh we just want to appreciate you all again for coming and presenting this information to us. And um, well, sounds God good. bless you all with the, uh, the challenges that you face as a council, and I thank you for taking the time to listen to our program. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Before we move on to the next item of our agenda, we're going to take a five-minute recess. The next item of our agenda is transfer maintenance and event scheduling of the Randolph Sports Complex from the City of Bristol to the Bristol, Virginia Public School System. Nobody signed up for public comment for this item. Uh, staff reports. 
Uh, Council, the Virginia, Bristol Virginia Public School System has approached the city uh, in the past. It's actually started um, probably right around when COVID began. And then due to COVID, things were just put on the back burner for a period of time to allow for um, the school system to take over certain fields within uh, the city so that they could better schedule their high school sports teams and then also work with Little League and uh, girls softball so that they could have better access to certain fields throughout the city as well. I have um, Mr. Brad Harper uh, here tonight. He's on Zoom and he's going to kind of go through the process of what he's thinking and why he thinks it would be a benefit to our city and to the students who play um, sports on our baseball and softball fields. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, members of the council and Mr. Eves, I appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate the jobs that you guys do for our city on a daily basis and listening to the first half of the meeting. This certainly doesn't seem near as important as uh, some of the issues that we've discussed, but it is important for our kids. And I think it can be a beneficial move for not only our current student athletes, uh, but for our youth programs and all of the citizens of, of Bristol, Virginia in the long run. Um, basically, I, I know you guys have had a long meeting, so I will not take too much of your time. I'll be glad to take any questions. Um, the most immediate need right now is um, the thought of what is currently named Central Little League uh, field, which is adjacent to Boys Cops, our baseball stadium, and then in the same complex as our football stadium, uh, that field becoming our home softball field uh, would require just minimal amount of maintenance. Um, and the biggest thing would possibly uh, would just be um, take, tearing up the sod, uh, taking up the sod and repurposing that somewhere else within the city. And the dimensions are very similar. Uh, we need some little bit of work on the uh, outfield, but a very easy process and um, it would allow us that opportunity to have our home fields, even though they're not on the campus of Virginia High School, um, all right there together for most of our spring events other than soccer, which for the time being, we would still continue to use uh, the lower field at Sugar Hollow Park. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the past couple of years due to maintenance issues or lack of staffing, we have taken a more hands-on role in the um, lining and maintenance of the field. And we were hoping that if we're able to reach some type of agreement um, in time, that this would take a little bit of burden off of the city and place a little more, uh, almost like these fields were on campus, I guess, and that we would be able to help with the maintenance, the lining and preparation and the use of the fields in terms of scheduling and just trying to streamline that process a little bit better. In, in my 10 years, uh, almost 10 years in the city of Bristol, you know, I, I do believe we're a group filled with a really good intention, but we don't always maybe communicate effectively. And that's both ways. That's from the school division with, with the city. And, and, you know, you've got a lot of different people that need to be involved in that process. So hopefully giving us um, some more control over that would help ease that burden and allow us to use our current, some of our city employees in a, that would help the city instead of spending four or five hours lining the football field or, or mowing or, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, we need to probably get into the details of that a little bit more later on. Um, but, you know, this is kind of a thing that we do not want to hurt the Little League in any way, shape or form um, due to those that are our future Bearcats. And so this is not something that is put into place to be against Little League. Um, the plan would be that uh, Little League, either Little League program could still use uh, our fields, um, especially that central, what is the, currently the central Little League field, anytime that we're not. Um, Little League softball would keep the current Highland View Little League field. Little League baseball would keep Eastern Little League. And one thing that I've noticed is that the fields at Sugar Hollow give us a lot of flexibility with the temporary fencing and some different things to use for either sports. So again, I guess the biggest thing, it's not, this is not anti 
Little League in any way, shape, or form. We want those kids to grow up and be Virginia High Bearcats and, and be involved in baseball, softball, or whatever the case may be. But that's kind of the immediate request. I think in terms of some communication in the very near future of what what exactly this um, control or scheduling or whatever you want to call it would look like, I think we, you know, we probably need to dig into the weeds a little bit deeper with that uh, in terms of, you know, funding. But my hope is that it would be almost a budget neutral, um, if not completely budget neutral for, for both parties. But I, I don't make, I am prepared based on where I'm at today to get too deep into that. I have sent Mr. Eads a PowerPoint, a draft of a PowerPoint as with some thoughts and proposal ideas. Um, and I would be glad to share with members of the council at any time. <clears throat> but uh, like I said, I think the biggest thing is just really at this current time asking because spring practices started yesterday, of course, officially in this Commonwealth of Virginia. Then of course it rained this afternoon, which is pretty much par for the course for spring. But um, moving forward though, we are requesting the use of uh, what is currently I've named after um, Mr. Fred Bowman um, at Central Little, Fred Bowman Field at Central Little League um, to become the official home of Virginia High Bearcat softball, and then continuing some conversations down the road of um, us maintaining that entire complex. Mr. Harper, just for clarification for everyone here tonight, it is really the most imperative thing that you have is. Uh, determining whether or not the city would allow the Virginia High School girls softball team to use Central Little League field um, in the meantime while we work on these other details with all the other sports complex fields. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. We just don't want to do anything. I and mean, we understand, you know, that's all city property and, you know, you answer and, and work for other groups other than just the school system. And so we just wanted to try to be transparent and upfront in this. We did not want to move in or take over without there being some official communication and and the opportunity to discuss this. But yes, sir, that is the most that is the most immediate request. And the biggest part there would be, you know, the contents uh in those buildings, um the ability to sell concessions and the ability for one ticket, like if we're hosting multiple spring events, one ticket at any of the corner would allow people to move back and forth between baseball and softball without having to move their vehicle. Okay. And obviously, you know, the removal of the sod would be the probably the thing that would catch people's attention, um, you know, and, and make them pick up the phone and call you or email you or anything else. Sure. So. Okay. So, Council, do you all have any questions? And then... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Okay, we've we've been running these ball fields in the school for decades and decades. What's the driving factor for this request now? Uh, is, is it a scheduling issue? Is it maintenance on the field issues? What, what's the driver to this request? I think the biggest thing is um, the location for our for our softball team. This idea was proposed to me. Uh, by our um, by our softball coach, and just thought it would be helpful to have everything. You know, the maintenance department is is right there, close. Um, you know, to try to avoid. You know, we did have a couple of conversations in the past where they were able to work on the baseball field, but because of the equipment being right there and not the softball field. Uh, and you know, of course, you know as well as I do that is a Title IX issue. Um, that I do not want to be involved in and, you know, uh, do not want the school system or the city involved in. Um, I think uh, not really a scheduling issue as much as just a better environment. Um, Highland View, uh, where we currently have played for the past several years, as, um, you know, really suffers anytime it rains because of how the, it's shaped in that bowl and the runoff, so a lot of work gets redone anytime there's a hard rain, um, you know, we can have it ready to go. Hard rain, it ruts it out and 
so you do you have a little bit with that creek there at um at the randolph sports complex and a more flat area um will hopefully prevent that so we're not constantly investing in turfus or dirt or brick dust or or whatever um and again i think it's an opportunity for our fans to um see multiple events um you know i think and the other part is i I hope that it takes some of the burden off the off of the city in the long run um because you talk about uh i forget who i had the conversation with but you know several years ago there were so many uh people in the maintenance department and we've lost some of those positions some of just have not been filled yet but you know we lost a very good employee uh here recently who worked very hard on the fields and always did a tremendous job um i think he relocated to florida and you know we'll we'll miss him and i'm sure there'll be somebody there but if it's on you know if it were an on-campus facility um you know the city's probably not coming in and doing some of the stuff that we asked them to do and you know we understand the situation financially where where we are as a city and in a school system and hopefully there are brighter days coming due to your guys's hard work and diligence but i think it's, there's several factors but i think the biggest is just truthfully a, a better venue for us to, to, that allows us to and our fans to see multiple things in the spring without having to drive from highland view to boys cox or or vice versa okay and uh is the field going to be exclusive to uh, the girls' soccer? I mean, the girls' softball? No, I mean, we can certainly, I mean, that would be the home field, but it, we would work with, you know, Little League. They're welcome to come in and practice there when, when we're done. Or, I mean, it would be pretty much that same time schedule. You know, it just would be Coach Belcher and, and myself working to, um, if we host tournaments or d- different things, um, you know that, that that would come through us but we still want to be a good partner with those little league programs because they're the future of you know of our programs okay i just have a couple of comments so being a, a parent of some former softball players and a baseball player i think um, and going through from li- all of these fields from little league to the high school fields um i've had experience at all of them so I like the idea of having softball right next to the baseball field because I was one of those parents for years that ran back and forth across town. So that's, I think that's great. One of the questions I have um, is just making sure for the Little League, so it used to be that the baseball, um, Little League baseball played at Central and at Eastern Little League fields. So would they primarily take over the Eastern field and would that I'm sure you've had these conversations. I'm just wanting to hear what they've said. Um, they would use the Eastern Little League field um, until high school softball is over? Or will they need you know, both uh, fields? I don't know what their numbers look like. Do they still need both fields? I think that was part of the issue. I don't think Central has been used for anything other than a practice field for maybe, okay. and, and I'm sure COVID had a part in that as well. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that they, they being Little League Baseball, liked about it was having the grass infield, um, you know, for, you know, and obviously it slows the ball down. Um, but, you know, we would still work with either organization in terms of allowing them to use, you know, um, I grew up playing Little League Baseball and I did not have grass until I was, you know, grass infield until I was much older, um, you know, sometimes in T-ball not having grass can be a, a benefit because the, you know they just barely hit it off the tee and so it allows the ball to roll a little bit you know so there's pros and cons there um but you know we would work with uh, both little league baseball and or little league softball to um to like i said be a good partner and allow them to use those facilities um as needed but i think one of the things that kind of brought it to coach belcher is on the little league softball board um and you know i think through some conversations that central was only really used as a practice field and you know that would be the same for uh bell meadows and 
Sugar Hollow, or not Sugar Hollow, but uh, the field at Stonewall, or, or any of, or the field at Sugar Hollow through the Parks and Rec Department. You know, we, we're blessed to have several fields. Um, so I think it would just be communication and, and and working together to make sure that anywhere they needed, they would be able to use. Yep, I agree. And I think um, I also like the idea of them being able to have their concessions and, you know, then Little League could have their concessions at the other fields and make their money off that. And then the high school can have their own concessions. Um, yep, because, you know, that helps with the fundraising for buying whatever it is, uniforms or whatever. Yep. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Harper, thank you for your presentation. It's, it's been very enlightening. Uh, including kind of as, as, as Ms. Nave um, mentioned, the, uh, the concession situation that's been very surprising to me. Um, so I just had a, I had a question for you and then I'll have a question for, for the city manager. So just to be clear, the, the Little League is, is on board with this fully? Because I know you said you'd had discussions with them, but, but they're 100% they're on board? Yes, sir. Uh, Josh Slagle and I have spoken. Um, I have not talked to the softball board, but they're not really affected in any way, shape, or form other than they wanted to keep, you know, there was a conversation at one point of uh, the request of us moving all softball to Central, um, but then you were kind of getting into a situation where one group had more more fields than the other. And again, I don't I don't think that's a good um premise to have and, and i think again that's where having those fields at sugar hollow that have the fence that can be moved um and the bases that can be moved gives us some flexibility for baseball and or softball thank you and, and i have a question for the city manager on this too i know we had spoken earlier about this um what is the approximate amount of money we spend as a city of keeping the field well, I mean, if you're talking manpower, we had one person who was dedicated to the manpower at Boyce Cox Field and to the um, Gene Malcolm Stadium as well. And he also took care of the field, um, the central Little League field that we've been talking about tonight. So you'd be looking at his salary plus any of the upkeep with the maintenance. You know, it's uh, north of $50,000. And so basically, if, if we do this, we would just appropriate that additional amount to the school and have them. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves and give the school something they haven't asked for yet. <laughs> well, no, just, I mean, theoretically, is that is that what would happen uh, in yeah, theory? I think there's been discussions about how we would deal with that in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something I think that would be worked out over the next several months. OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper, for presentation. I have one question to you. It's a real minor thing, but uh, is the uh, dimensions at Central, would that fit for a regulation softball field? Yes, sir, it would. Okay. Um, and, you know, overall, and uh, you know, the, the concept I like, uh, the bringing all the high school athletics together on really a complex as well as uh, kind of making the, the scheduling and the management of this easier. Uh, I think, you know, however we proceed, you know, we're really blessed with a lot of great fields. And I think utilizing those as an asset, there, there can be some advantages. But in the past, uh, it seems there's always been issues of scheduling and, and people, one person talking to one person, the other talking and or maybe not talking uh, about what's going on at the event. So I think that can help and uh, particularly during some of that downtime and even over the summer maybe can uh, lead to greater use of those fields, greater uh, opportunities for the community. And so uh, my question would be for Mr. Eads, what, what do you need from us tonight? Well, then? first I want to clarify, it's not north of 50,000 for that one central Little League field. I was talking about all the sports complexes right there near Boyce uh, Field. So to just narrow down exactly for the Central Little League, I don't have a specific number for that. Um, really what we need, in, really just a motion tonight to allow uh, the Bristol Virginia High School girls softball team a use of Central Little League field, uh, at least through the remainder of this season and then as we move throughout the season and work with the school system uh, to narrow down 
other requests and how we move forward, we can bring that back to you all sometime probably in June before July 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I'm happy to make that motion. If you so is this motion being made uh, permanent or on a temporary basis to see how it goes? I think what's going to happen over the, and Mr. Harper, correct me if I'm wrong, I think what's going to happen, you know, this is, I guess we would call it temporary, but knowing that we're going to work towards a more permanent solution between now and end of June. Yes, sir. Okay. So you want the motion to be through the end of the fiscal year, basically? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so that basically the motion would be to go ahead and allow uh, the, the public school system to utilize uh, Central Little League uh, Fred Bowman Field uh, for uh, their softball and then to work on a longer term agreement uh, be by the end of the year, fiscal year. Yes. Is that, I think, okay. I second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further council discussion? discussion item I just wanted to ask is um, is there any type of transition with with insurance or liability in doing this or is, is it essentially it's all city owned property anyway? it's still city owned property and you know the school system they have their own insurance as well for their players okay okay if there's no further discussion clerk please call the roll Hartley yes Nave yes Osborne yes Wingard yes Farnham yes Uh, before we move on to our next item, we are going to take a five-minute recess. <laughs> the next item of our agenda, item three, which was formerly item four, approval of transfer of deed from the City of Bristol, Virginia, to the Industrial Development Authority of the City of Bristol. There uh, are, it, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say there were folks who signed up for public comment, Mr. Murphy and, and Mr. Roswell, and you all are together if one of you all want to speak first either one is fine um, or if we want to go ahead and do uh, staff comment that's fine as well good afternoon my name is Marty Murphy 124 East Thompson Street Thompson Georgia I'm here to represent Tidal Wave Auto Spa car wash um, this opportunity to come before this council and mayor and the staff members is greatly appreciated. Uh, we've met before previously talking about Tidal Wave Auto Spa and as I stated to you previously, you know, our strive to create the, the nicest business in the city of Bristol, Virginia while creating a wonderful service, a wonderful business partnership with the city and also job opportunities, you know, that is our strive for excellence to provide that to the city. Um, I know we've been through this before. I would just like to say that I'm here for any questions. I don't want to bore you with the items that I have discussed before about the company. Uh, we're currently 92 washes. Look for Bristol to be uh, one of the few to start in the near future here. Uh, just to let you know, as far as plans and uh, building plans, civil plans, we've gone through all the processes. Uh, Mr. Mike Johnson with the building department, with Mr. John Puckett with the uh, engineering department, all those approved state NOI is approved and SWIP and everything. So we're prepared to move forward with this project. Um, I'm here for any questions, so I'm open for that. Okay. Like this, uh, hi, I'm Brent Rosswall, Interstate Development. Um, been working on the falls since 2012, back in the beginning. But one thing, the Tidal Wave, um, when we, we've been working with them for quite a while, not only are we getting a uh, first class car wash, but they also are completely grading lot 20, which needs to be, it's kind of an eyesore coming into one of the main entrances of the falls. And they are going under contract with another party who is going to develop a little strip building. And we're happy to see that the whole lot will be developed, the whole lot will be landscaped, and that area will be cleaned up. Uh, and if there's any questions for, for these folks, we can certainly jump in and I'd also like to add um, staff report as well Mr. Eads if you had anything to add as well uh, yeah council before you tonight is a, a transfer of deed from the city to the industrial development authority this deed would uh, give lot 20 uh, to the industrial development authority it has to be transferred uh, by a 4-1 vote and uh, as Mr. Murphy 
And Mr. Roswell have stated this is for tidal wave car wash to be located on a portion of lot 20 and the other, another portion of lot 20 would be divided out to provide for another type of business there in the future. Okay. Well, a uh, question I had for you guys, you can't give us any inclination of, uh, of your tenants next door, possibly, could you? Uh, I called and confirmed today that if we get the approvals to move forward that we would sign the PSA agreement with them at that time. They said they would disclose the restaurant that is uh, pursuing interest in this property, which I call it Parcel A. Mm -hmm. uh, we're par I mean, I'm sorry, we're Parcel A, that would be Parcel B. And as Mr. Brand has suggested, we are, you know, our plans have been approved that we would grade and landscape the entire parcel. Okay. Uh, one thing, one thing on the um, PSA and the site plan exhibit attached, I will say that the other building does have a drive-through. Mm -hmm. They won't tell us who, but it's got a drive-through. Okay. Okay. So, if you have <clears throat> yeah. Can you, uh, if we approve this tonight, can you give us a sense of timeline? How quickly both you you think as well as I know it's not necessarily uh, the parcel B or, or the other part, but just kind of both parts have a rough timeline. Our time schedule is once we start here, which hopefully we'll be on location in two weeks, um, we will be 24 weeks build schedule, 24 week timeline. And as far as uh, parcel B, you know, we, we'll have to go through that process with them. They'll have to do the submittals just like we did with the city engineers and building departments and go through that process. Okay. So I would imagine that would be, you know, first or second quarter of 2023 before they could get uh, completely built on parcel B. Thank you. Mr. Eads, as far as the process is, uh, is the next step the a reading of the resolution and then a motion to, a motion and a second for yes. that? You want me to go ahead and read the resolution? Um, uh, yes. A resolution for the sale of city-owned property, whereas the city of Bristol is a lawful owner of numerous, numerous parcels of property located within the city limits of the city of Bristol and within Washington County, Virginia, and whereas the city owns property described as plat of lots 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, the falls phase two, and public storm drainage easement lot six, phase one, located in the city of Bristol, Virginia. Industrial Development Authority of the City of Bristol, Virginia, 300 Lee Street, Bristol, Virginia, 24201, of record in the office of the Clerk of the Circuit Court for the City of Bristol, in Plat Book 4, pages 550 through 552, slide 285. And whereas the City wishes to transfer to the Industrial Development Authority of the City of Bristol, Virginia, Lot 20, as more particularly described in Exhibit A attached here too, and whereas the City wishes to convey its rights, title, and interest in and to the aforementioned property to the Industrial Development Authority of the City of Bristol, Virginia, in order for the IDA to transfer the property to TWAS Properties, LLC, a Delaware Limited Liability Company, there will therefore be a resolved by the City Council for the City of Bristol, Virginia, that the City of Bristol, Virginia will sell and convey its rights, titles, and interest in and to the real property as described upon the full payment of the purchase price, be it further resolved pursuant to Article 7, Section 9 of the Constitution and 50, Section 15.2-1800 of the Code of Virginia in 1950 as amended. City Council has the authority to dispose of real estate owned by the city and be it further resolved that all appropriate officials are authorized to sign and the, sign the appropriate documents necessary to subdivide and convey its rights, title, and interest in and to the real property as described. Thank you, Mr. Eads. So we are looking for a motion from the council. I move that we approve the resolution. Second. Okay. There's a motion from Mr. Hartley and a second from Mr. Osborne. Is there a council discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? No. Farnham? Yes. The next item of our agenda. Thank you, Council. Yes, thank, thank you, guys. You. 
the first amendment to declaration of restrictions on lot 20 to, of the falls development staff report uh, council, council before you and i do have mike hamlin here with uh interstate realty who uh can probably answer some more specific questions but what you have is an amendment to the declaration of restrictions on lot 20 previously lot 20 it was not authorized for a car wash and this uh, first amendment to the declaration of restrictions would remove that restriction specifically to lot 20 which will, would allow a car wash to proceed on lot 20 uh, that was just approved by council okay um, what's the pleasure of the council uh, I move to approve the first amendment to the declaration of restriction for lot 20 for the falls <clears throat> I'll second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Is there any council discussion or questions? So, uh, oh, go ahead. No, you oh, thank you. So I, I do have a couple questions. So this specifically just removes the restriction on lot 20 only, correct? On lot 20 only, yes. Okay. And Mike, that's your understanding as well, correct? What was the question? It just removes the restrictions on lot 20 only. Only the car wash. Yes. Okay, that that was going to be my yes. next question. Is it all the the restrictions or just that just the specific wash. one? Okay. What the public's restrictions already null and void. They're expired. So literally, then just to be just to clarify, the only thing is lot twenty for car washes only. That's correct. If there's uh, no further discussion, we do have a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? No. Farnham? Yes. The next item of our agenda is a supplemental appropriation of $600,000. Nobody signed up for public comment for this item. Staff report. Council, this item is a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $600,000. General fund amount is $300,000, and that is to appropriate the beginning balance revenues to transfer to the solid waste disposal fund for addi additional professional services required for specific projects. The solid waste disposal fund amount is $300,000 for disposal ser in disposal services to appropriate transfers from the general fund for additional professional services required for specific projects. Do you want to be clear that the amount in the general fund is coming from beginning balance, unassigned fund balance? Okay. Staff does recommend that council approve the supplemental appropriation as listed. Thank you. We're looking for a motion from the council. Uh, I move for approval of the supplemental appropriation as presented. I'll second. We have a motion from Mr. Osborne and a second from Mr. Hartley. Is there any council discussion or questions? So just to be clear for uh, the people watching, just so we understand it, um, the actual amount is 300000 but we're moving it from one thing to another, and it, the total that's being spent is 300000 correct? Yes. Uh, 300000 will be expended out of the solid waste disposal fund, but we have to move it from the general fund to get it there. So yes. and that's why the appropriation is 600 because yes. you're appropriating 300 from general fund to solid waste, and that 300 is being spent. Right, right. Okay. The, um, I know we've made quite a few supplemental appropriations this fiscal year. Do you anticipate that this will carry us through the end of the fiscal year or will we probably be looking at yet another one that was the plan for at the time of this appropriation request um yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't say that it, it can't no. happen but the plan was specifically in this account to get it through june 30th okay mm -hmm. okay if there's no other further council discussion clerk Please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. 
The next item of our agenda is presentation of fiscal year 22 quarterly financial update. No one signed up for public comment. Staff report. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council. This is the finance update for the second quarter of fiscal year 22. Data as of December 31st, 2021. This data is prepared on a cash basis. Revenues the city has received and expenditures the city has paid. Just as a reminder, as always, this is unaudited data. So our general fund summary with a budget of 57.8 million, 33.1 million in revenues, 57% of the budget, expenditures of 31.4 million, 54% of the budget for a fund balance at December 31st of $1.6 million. Our solid waste disposal summary with a budget of $8 million, revenues of 4.6 million, 57% of budget, expenditures of 3.7 million, 46% of budget, for a balance at December 31st of $872,410. Our local capital projects fund with a budget of 172,000, Revenues of 172,100% of budget, and these are general fund transfers to our local capital projects fund. Expenditures of $86,576, 50% of budget for a small balance there of $85,424. Our state and federal capital fund with a budget of 6.5 million, revenues of 115 $1,281, 2% of budget, expenditures of $145,216, again, 2% of budget for a small fund deficit there, and that will be due from state, from, um, state revenues for um, capital projects. Our transit fund with a budget of $570,709. Revenues of $241,218, expenditures of $228,057 for a slight fund surplus there. So here's the general fund revenue summary of the $33 million received by the general fund at December 31st. $23.5 million is from local sources, $8 million is from state sources, and then um, 1.5 million is from the federal government. This is what our general fund revenue looks like, what monies the general fund has received. The blue, our local revenue is at 71%. It is 66% of our general fund budget. The state is shown in red at 24%. It is 27% of our general fund budget. And our federal revenue there is shown in green at 5% and it is a smaller percentage of our general fund budget at 7%. So the revenue composition is right in line with the budget coming out of the December 5th tax deadline. Our financial data graphs, fiscal year 18 is shown in orange, fiscal year 19 is shown in gray, fiscal year 20 is shown in yellow, fiscal year 21 in red, and fiscal year 22 in green. So local sales and use tax up from all periods presented. Consumer utility taxes are holding steady. Cigarette taxes are consistent with prior years, just down slightly. Our lodging taxes are up from all years presented, as are our restaurant meal taxes up from all years presented. When I present this to the Finance Committee, I always point out that the shape of the lodging graph and the shape of our meal tax is um, is almost identical. So this is what our sales tax revenue with a budget of 3.85 million looks like as it is received by the city. The blue is the three-year average and the orange is current year data. Sales tax runs behind two months, meaning that revenues re received in December were for the month of October. This is what the city's meals tax with a budget of 5.2 million looks like as it is received by the city. And December collections here run one month behind, therefore the month of November. So we are above the three year average there. Lodging taxes with a budget of 1.287 million as it is received by the city. This is what it looks like as it comes in. And this um, tax one, runs one month behind as well. December collections are for the month of November. Once again, 
current year data is above the three-year average. So the target revenue report. The previous graphs show actual to actual comparison between fiscal years. This report shows the fiscal year 22 budget to actual comparison. Total positive um, variances of $1.375 million. Sales and use tax has a positive budget variance of $305,000. Consumer utility tax has a slight positive budget variance. Taxes on records has a positive budget variance of $67,000. Cigarette taxes have a slight negative budget variance. The lodging tax has a positive budget variance of $367,000. Our meal tax has a positive budget variance of $639,000. Electric consumption tax has a slight negative budget variance. Our admissions tax has a positive budget variance of $22,000. That is significant for the city. It's not a small budgeted amount, but it is an indicator of um, who is, how, much is, how much money is being spent in the city. Communications tax has a negative budget variance of $16,000. We reduced this budget for fiscal year 22 to be more in line with previous years, and we'll continue to look at that um, as we get further into this fiscal year and as we're developing revenues for fiscal year 23 budget. So the positive budget variance that I mentioned before of the $1.375 million is comprised primarily of the sales, lodging, and meals taxes. General fund expenditure summary for the year. If all expenditures were even throughout the fiscal year, the even benchmark at December 31st would be 50%. Government administration is at 44%. Judicial administration is at 47%. Public safety is at 43%. Public works is at 42%. Health welfare and social services is at 48%. Education is at 100%. And that is due to the timing of their state and federal reimbursements for fiscal year 22. Parks, recreation, and cultural is at 47%. Community development is at 34%. Non-departmental is at 40%. Debt is at 73% due to the timing of our debt payments. Transfers is at 56%. So overall expenditures for the general fund is at 54%, but you can see the vast majority of our departments are trending under budget. So this is what the general fund expenditures look like, how the city's money is spent. Education is at 24%. As so we progress throughout the fiscal year and they start to receive more of their federal and state revenues, that will drop down slightly. Public safety is at 23%. Um, Health, welfare, and social services is at 13%. Our debt is at 9.7%. Public works, 7%. Um, Transfer, 6.29%. Government administration, 4.52%. Parks, recreation, and cultural is at 4%. Judicial administration is at 3% community development at 1.62% and then non-departmental is at 1%. Once again, this is how the city's general fund monies are expended. Now, transitioning to solid waste, revenues of 4.6 million, 57% of budget, expenditures of 3.7 million, 46% of budget for that balance as mentioned earlier of $872,000. Cash in the Solid Waste Disposal Fund operating account is $3.898 million at December 31st. Keep in mind that that fund carries a $12 million liability on its audited financial statements. Once again, six months into the fiscal year, the even benchmark would be 50%. Disposal revenue is at 47%. Collection revenue is at 58%. Non-operating revenue is up at um, 75%. That is primarily the beginning cash balance. $600,000 has already been rolled forward and transfers from the general fund. Disposal expenditures are at 36%, primarily trending downward due to um, personnel vacancies and to the large projects that, are not com that were not completed for payment at December 31st. Collection expenditures are at 40%. 
due primarily to the timing of certain equipment lease payments. Debt expenditures are at 82% and keep in mind that debt is 30% of the original solid waste disposal fund budget. Falls phases two and three update that is presented to council quarterly. You can see the budgeted revenues total $774,150. Year to date revenues total $391,131 um, $131, or 51%. Debt allocated to the falls for this fiscal year is just over $3 million. And um, we've paid 67% of that. Little good news here, the revenue sharing, which is budgeted at $350,000, halfway through the fiscal year, um, we've only had to pay out a little over 50,000 there. We expect the second half to look like that as well. So that's a little bit of good news. So we budget a deficit at the, for the falls for phases two and three of right at $2.6 million in our general fund. And through December 31st, we're right at 1.7, but we're in line with where we budget. Our debt service schedule. And this is the information on the city's upcoming debt schedule. And I have been asked by members of the finance committee to present this information quarterly so that decision makers and the public sees this information regularly. This is citywide general obligation bonded debt backed by the full faith and credit of the city of Bristol. What you can see in the first two columns is that the citywide bond payments will increase to over $7.5 million through fiscal year 28, and the shortfall then related to that increase. Then detailed out is the refinance savings back from 2018. We use the last piece of that in this fiscal year. Um, so that gives us a net payment of which portion $1 million that we used to budget to building up um, the, the fund balance and or reserve. We're now using that to offset that increase. Then as the revenue sharing payment expires, um, those monies can be used toward the debt escalation. The unexpended debt service reserves that council has committed in June of 2019, June of 2020, and June of 2021, totaling $3 million will be used to offset the escalating payments. So that's a lot of numbers and a lot of words, but what this really tells us is that the city has a written plan into um, that gets us um, into fiscal year 27 to offset that escalating debt payments. And the hope is that we will have new revenue sources by that time to, um, to address the escalating debt. So the operating cash balance at December 31st, 2021 was $22,763,686. Um, $22 that balance at December 31st, 2020 was 20.88 million. Two years ago, 17.98 million. Three years ago, 15.4 million. Four years ago, in 1231, 2017, 8.1 million. And um, December 31st, 2016, that cash balance was 7.7 .7 million. We used to present the current year and three years historical data. We were asked um, to go ahead and show two more years just so you can really get an idea of um, the work the city has done, not only to get off the tan, but to shore up its ca cash balance. Also there, the reserves, um, um, a general reserve of 1.447 million and a debt reserve of 3 million that you saw in the debt slide will be, that will be used to pay um, our escalating debt payments in the future. And there, um, it's also shown the TAN information Fiscal year um, 17 was the last time that the TAN was used, tax anticipation notes, to pay operating expenses of 1.7 million. 15, 16, 2.4 million was used. In 14, 15, 6.7 million was used. And in 13, 14, 7.6 million was used. So this graph shows the city's cash balance at month end. The green line is the current year. The red line is fiscal year 21, the gray line is fiscal year 20, the orange line is fiscal year 19, and the blue line is fiscal year 18. You can see the trend here of how our cash is used. Keep in mind, this is the balance at month end. It does vary during the month, but you can see the curve here. 
Also, I think it's important to note that in the blue, um, that the cash balance was below $5 million at July 2017 in fiscal year um, 18. And Council, that concludes the presentation of the financial data as, at December 31st, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments? I have a couple things. First off, um, I think I say this every time you do this, but you know, as a member of the Finance Committee, um, thank you. Um, I, get, I get a preview of this before we see it as a, as a whole. Um, thank you for the work you put in, and, and thank you to the other members of the Finance Committee, the mayor included, and our, uh, some of our constitutional officers. Um, a lot of work goes into this, and the city has made great strides uh, over the past several years. Um, I do have a couple questions. So you'd, we budget for 350 for the revenue sharing with Washington County, and you say we're basically on target theoretically to pay out about $100,000 by the end of the fiscal year. Was that? Yes. Okay. And for the admissions tax. So our target for admissions tax was 16500 right. per year. And we, ba we, we basically we've doubled that at this point. Right through half the year. So uh, offhand, other than rhythm and roots, what are the sources of our admissions tax? Do you, do you know, or the city manager? I don't know if I'm allowed to say by entity. I think you know, we'd be better off not to say by entity. Uh, it's, you know, there is a state code that prevents us from saying the specific entity. I would also remind council that previous to COVID, we budgeted about $100,000 for admissions tax. Yeah. And, um, the reason we budgeted 16,000 this past year is simply because we did not know what 2021 was going to bring as far as events in the city and if we would be able to um, have any events. In in generalities, what type of things qualify as uh, as admissions tax taxable? I would add to any festival type events, um, a, a movie theater, um, that type, anything that charges that type of admission. Anything with a ticket. Anything entertainment related, basically. Right. Now we'll point out that um, during um, the fall of 2020, which would have been in fiscal year 21, our admissions tax actually went negative um, because we had to issue so many refunds. So that was part of the thought process there for budgeting so conservatively with the admissions mm -hmm. tax. Okay. <clears throat> question <clears throat> excuse me um the one slide you showed the capital fund i think you'd only to date spent two percent is there a reason these pro i mean i know that generally a lot a lot of those are state funded as well and the money we can roll carry forward uh reappropriate for the coming year but is there just in general reason those are lagging behind so yes, far for the last couple of years um um, the timing of those road or infrastructure projects funded almost entirely by the federal and state government has been behind what was anticipated during the planning stages. So we're going to try during this year's um, budget process to get, to get the actuals more in line, um, to get the budget more in line with the timing of the actuals. And but I, I it is based on, um, it is based on the timing of those projects. And I would also say there was one large project that when this budget was being put together this time last year, we were anticipating that project going ahead and start. When it went out to bid, everything come in well above what was anticipated. So now the state is having to relook at, look, re -look at that whole project to figure out um, what the budget should be for that project based on the bids that they received for the project. Wow. Um, you know, just in, in general, uh, uh, kind of like uh, the vice mayor said, I appreciate the work y'all have done when you look at this, you know, we budget very conservatively and revenues are exceeding our expectations, but yet the departments are still holding the line and, and keeping expenses under where, you know, if you just did 50% for half the year, they're all, I think, under budget. So I uh, appreciate the work everybody's uh, has been doing over the past few years as well as continue that uh, going forward. 
One thing uh, that kind of struck me when you're doing that, if you can go back in your slides, yes, Ms. Bradley. I, I, I think I can. Uh, was <clears throat> back to the bar graphs. It was fa fairly early on. Yeah, because you can see, uh, well, like meals tax, lodging tax, sales tax, the things that are up, but you can see how, you know, in uh, 18, 19, 20, you start to see this path up, and then definitely 21, it dropped, but now, I mean, so it's real clear to see how uh, COVID impacted, especially in those areas of, of sales tax, lodging tax, meals tax, but before we were on a good trajectory and it looks like we're, we're, we're kind of recovered to some degree, uh, although, you know, hopefully uh, the, the recovery's um, more stable, but, but we're kind of back on that upward path. Right. So that's uh, good news as we kind of enter into the budget season. Right. And we anticipated um, the yellow shown there for lodging and meals tax in fiscal year 20. Um, you know, one quarter of that was under COVID. So that yellow would have even been more, um, would have been higher up there if had it not been for COVID. So. Well, thank you for the work you're doing. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's a team effort. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Bradlin. Uh, the next item of our agenda, uh, first reading of ordinances, item E1, an ordinance to create a zoning map amendment for property located at 2016 Beta Drive. Nobody signed up for public comment for this item. Staff report. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, staff had received a application for a zoning map amendment by Soft Rock Properties LLC for property that they own located at 2016 Veda Drive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Property is currently zoned R2, single and two family residential, and the request is to rezone the property to B3 General Commercial District. The owner plans to use the property to construct a boutique hotel. The property consists of approximately 0.385 acres and currently has a single family house. <clears throat> the Planning Commission recommended the request for a joint public hearing on December 20th, 2021. A joint public hearing was held at the regular city council meeting on January 11th, 2022. The request was recommended to the city council for approval by the Planning Commission by a 4-2 vote at its January 18, 2022 meeting. The request was approved by the City Council at the February 8, 2022 meeting. Staff recommends approval of the zoning map amendment request on first reading. Okay, thank you. We're looking for a motion from the Council to have the first reading, and this can be a full reading or by a caption only. Uh, I move for the first reading of the ordinance by caption only. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Is there any council discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? No. Farnham? Yes. A reading of the ordinance by caption only. Ordinance number 22-3, an ordinance by the City Council of Bristol, Virginia, approving the request by Soft Rock LLC to amend the city zoning map from single and two-family residential R2 to general commercial district B3 for property described as 2016 Veda Drive, map parcel number 22-2-2-1, a quarter acre parcel in 22-2-2-2, a .135 acre parcel. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next item of our agenda, second reading of ordinances, item F1, an ordinance to create a zoning map amendment for property lo located on Island Road. Nobody signed up for public comment for this item. Staff report. Yes, uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, staff has received an application for a zoning map amendment for property owned by Steel Creek 237 LLC. The property is located at the corner of Island Road and Steel Creek Road. The property is currently zoned R2, single and two family residential, and the request is to rezone the property to R3, moderate density residential. The owner plans to use the property for a new public street and to construct multifamily residential structures. The property consists of approximately 12.5 acres and is currently vacant. <clears throat> the 
Planning Commission recommended the request for a joint public hearing with City Council on December 20th, 2021. Public hearing was held at the regular council meeting on January 11th, 2022. The request was recommended to the City Council for approval by the Planning Commission by a 6-0 vote at its January 18th, 2022 meeting. The request was approved by the City Council at the January 25th, 2022 meeting. First reading of the ordinance was approved by the City Council at the February 8th, 2022 meeting. Staff recommends approval of the zoning map amendment request on second reading. Okay, thank you. So we're looking for a motion for the second reading of the ordinance and this can be by full reading or by caption only. Uh, I make a motion that we proceed to second reading of the ordinance by caption only. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any council discussion? Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Dietrich one question. Uh, I think before we had talked about the uh, portion of this uh, that lies in the state of Tennessee and, and they're going through their rezoning process. Yes. Can you give an update on that? Is that moving forward? Bristol, Tennessee did approve the ordinance or the, the rezoning request on first reading. They do things a little differently, but they're, they will have a second reading and a public hearing at their first meeting in March. So if it is approved on second reading, then there's a 17 day wait before it becomes effective. So it'll be about and we still the same time. Yeah, we have 30 right. days. Right, so it's, it's within a few days okay. that they would both, assuming all of them are approved. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the second reading by caption only. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Um, Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. Reading of the ordinance by caption only. Ordinance number 22-2, an ordinance by the City Council of Bristol, Virginia, approving the request by Still Creek 237 LLC to amend the city's zoning map from single and two-family residential R2 to moderate density residential R3 for property described as map parcel number 412-A-1 and a 11.94 acre parcel and 412-A-1A, a 0.63 acre parcel located on Island Road and Still Creek Road. Thank you. So we're looking for a motion to adopt the ordinance. Uh, I move for adoption of the ordinance as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the ordinance. Clerk, please call the roll. Hartley? Yes. Nave? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Farnham? Yes. Uh, the next item is our consent agenda. Do we have anything on our consent Nothing. agenda tonight? Nothing. Okay. Well, that's the last item of our agenda. If there's no further business, we stand adjourned.